Welcome back to the equine anatomy lectures. Um, we will continue our discussion on the anatomy of the equine forelimb. And um, as, as you recall from uh, previous lectures, we've talked about how important this, uh, this topic is. We've mentioned that uh, the forelimb encounters a number of clinical cases, navicular disease, laminitis, sole abscess, etc. Uh, we then talked about the different articulations, the six different articulations in the forelimb. Uh, shoulder, elbow, carpus, uh, fetlock, pastern, and coffin. Uh, we then talked about the um, muscles uh, on the lateral and on the medial aspect of the forelimb. Uh, we mentioned also that on the medial aspect of the radius, there is no muscles. The bone is only covered with the periosteum. And we talked about periosteal stripping, and it was one of, her, of the procedures that promotes bone growth in cases of uh, angular limb deformities and, and, and folds. Um, after that, uh, we talked about a number of bursas, uh, olecranon bar bursa and the uh, bicipital bursa, and we said that um, infection that uh, took place in these in these um, uh, bursas would lead to uh, abscessation uh, or abscess formation in these in these bursas, and we need to drain them. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, bicipital bursitis, and we also talked about olecranon bursitis, or capped elbow, or shoe boy. Uh, in this lecture, we will talk about um, the muscles of the uh, forelimb, and we will dissect the clinical importance for each of these muscles, or muscle tendons. Also, I will be talking about a very important topic, and that is the passive stay apparatus. The passive stay apparatus. We'll define it, and we'll see what are the structures that is, are involved in uh, making this apparatus. You have seen this slide before. This is, these are the different muscles of the of the forelimb. Uh, this is a, uh, a a lateral view. This is a medial view, and we've talked about the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, and the suprascapular nerve and the Sweeney. Here we also talked about the biceps uh, brachialis uh, muscle and the tendon with bicipital bursitis. Uh, then we've talked about uh, remember the long head of the triceps and how we utilize that as one of the borders for the auscultation uh, triangle for for the heart and the lungs in the thorax muscle in the thorax uh, uh, section i'm sorry um now now here um uh, we we have the um dorsal and the lateral aspect of the radius and we have the uh, medial and the ventral aspect of the radius we also mentioned that the medial aspect does not have any muscles and only the periosteum is covering the, um, the radius, which means that we will utilize this uh, to uh, treat a, um, uh, angular limb deformities uh, to promote uh, bone growth uh, by doing periosteal stripping on the medial aspect of the radius. Now, I also mentioned a number of muscles in, on, the, on the dorsal and the lateral aspect of the, of the um, uh, uh, forelimb and on the ventral aspect of the forelimb. We, I also mentioned that it's important for us to remember the extensor carpi radialis muscle and also the uh, common digital extensor muscle on the dorsal and the lateral aspect of the, of the, uh, of the radius. Uh, and also on the ventral aspect, we have to remember the uh, uh, superficial digital flexor and the the uh, uh, deep digital uh, flexor. And um, now, now before I I move to talk about uh, these two muscles uh, on each side, uh, we'll talk about the uh, passive uh, stay apparatus of of the uh, forelimb. After I mentioned the muscles of the forelimb, I would like to mention. How does the forelimb stand for a long period of time without getting tired? And this is basically done by 
what we call the passive state apparatus. The passive state apparatus. And so what is the passive state apparatus? What's the definition of this passive state apparatus? It's a collection of structures, a collection of structures and mechanisms that allow the fore limb to stand for long periods of time with minimum energy expenditure and muscle slash tendon slash joint effort. So it's a collection of structures and mechanisms that allow the forelimb to stand for long periods of time with minimum energy expenditure and very low effort done by the muscles and tendons and joints of that forelimb. And it consists of structures that are specific for each of the joints. So for example, the shoulder joint, the shoulder joint is prevented from over flexion. This is the shoulder joint. And as you can see here, it's flexed. It is flexed. So we want to prevent over flexion. So the, the humerus will, will be here or here or here. We will prevent the overflexion of the shoulder joint by the tendon of the biceps brachialis muscle. The tendon of the biceps brachialis muscle prevents the shoulder joint from overflexion. That's a very important structure, and it is the first part of the passive stay apparatus. So the first part of the passive stay apparatus is the tendon of the biceps brachialis muscle, which prevents, this is the function of it now, it prevents overflexion of the shoulder joint. This is the first part of the passive stay apparatus. Now. The next joint is the elbow joint. This is the elbow joint. This is the distal end of the humerus. This is the proximal end of the radius and the ulna. Also, you can see that the, the a, um, joint is also flexed. So, to prevent overflexion of this joint, we have couple of structures that does this and first we have the collateral ligament of the elbow joint and the second thing is the fibrous component of the joint capsule this green the fibrous component of the joint capsule both of these the collateral ligaments of the uh, uh, elbow joint and the fibrous component of the joint capsule prevent overflexion of the elbow joint. This is the second component of the passive state apparatus of the uh, uh, four limbs. So we talked about the first one, the first uh, component was the tendon of the biceps brachialis which prevents the overflexion of the shoulder joint. Now we have the ligaments, uh, the collateral ligaments of the elbow joint, as well as the fibrous a uh, component of the joint capsule, which prevents overflexion of the elbow joint. These are the two joints now. Later, we will talk about the carpus and then the digits. Now, moving distally, so now we finish the humerus and the elbow. Moving distally, we're going to go to the radius now. This is the radius. And right here. And this is the 
dorsal aspect of the radius. This is the lateral aspect of the radius. And the two arrows here are pointing at two muscles that I told you to memorize. And these are the, we are on the extensor side. So these are the extensor carpi radialis and the common digital extensor. Extensor carpi radialis and the common digital extensor. I told you we're going to dissect each one, so we're going to see what the importance of each of them. Okay, so the very first thing I want you to, to remember about the tendons of these muscles is the fact that they reside over the carpus joint, over the carpus joint. Here's the carpus joint, and this one is the extensor carpi radialis, and this one is the common digital extensor. Both of them are on the dorsal aspect of the carpus. This is, this is the first row of carpal bones. This is the second row of carpal bones. Here is the radius. Here is the uh, metacarpal, uh, metatarsal bones, or metacarpal bones, I'm sorry. No, metatarsal is in the hind limb. This is metacarpal bones, so two, three, and four, medial to lateral, respectively. Okay, so what's the importance of the tendons of the extensor carpi radialis and the common digital extensor? Well, the importance of these two tendons is that we use them as landmarks when we inject the carpal joints. Remember that the carpal joints are three. We have a three carpal joints. We have the radiocarpal, we have the inner carpal, and we have the carpal metacarpal. We'll talk about the joints more later. But for now, we have to remember that the tendons of the extensor carpi radialis muscle and the tendon of the common digital extensor muscle pass over the carpal joints and we need to utilize those tendons when we do joint injections or joint anesthesia. This is a picture that shows basically the extensor carpi radialis tendon that's coming on the dorsal aspect of the three joints, this is the radius right here. This is the first row of carpal bones. This is the second row of carpal bones with the carpus flexed. The rest is the metacarpal bones two, three, and four. Now we can see the needles for joint injections. This is needle, this is lateral. You can see that the, the injections in the joint, whether it's joint injections or joint anesthesia, we're utilizing medial and lateral to the extensor carpi radialis tendon. The needle will be inserted medial or lateral to the tendon of the extensor carpi radialis. Always medial or lateral to the tendon of the extensor carpi radialis. This also, this landmark is also very important when we do procedures like arthroscopy. This is a, an arthroscopic images uh, of the carpus and, and of course uh, the, this is the synovial lining right here and you can see this is, this is, the, this is the, the lesions, we can see this here, this is after uh, 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 cleaning this this lesion, this is how uh, the the tissue at the end uh, becomes reddish because there's some blood and, and things like that from the surgery. But the key here is is not the surgery. The key is that we use the tendons as the landmarks to basically inject or uh, enter enter the uh, 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 carpal joints. 
again medial and lateral to the extensor carpi radialis tendon. I'll explain arthroscopy later and we will see how we will utilize both medial and lateral side to insert the camera in and insert the tools that we will be working with from the other opening because the in an arthroscopy you have to open a couple of openings so you can put one for the camera and one for the the uh, an instrument that you're going to be working with but we'll talk about that later not now for now we need to remember the landmarks to insert these tools and and cameras and that is medial and lateral to the tendon of the extensor carpi radialis muscle. Now, what about the common digital extensor tendon? Okay. The common digital extensor tendon inserts on the extensor process of the third phalanx or the coffin bone. This is the coffin bone and this is the extensor process of the coffin bone or also known as the third phalanx. What inserts, this is the only tendon that reaches the extensor process. This is the only tendon that reaches the extensor process, the common digital extensor tendon or the tendon of the common digital extensor muscle. It reaches the extensor process. Why this is important then? It's important because medial and lateral to that, you can inject or anesthetize the coffin joint right here. The coffin joint. This is a very important landmark some sometimes you even have calcification of of the of the tendon here which which makes it pretty painful in especially in older horses or in horses that received injuries on on these on these Cal calcification here is known as the pyramid disease we'll talk about that pyramid disease also when we talk about the hoof but now for the for the time being we need to remember that the only tendon in the body that reaches the extensor process of P3 or the third phalanx or the calf and bone, bone is the common digital extensor, extensor tendon or the tendon of the common digital extensor muscle. Sometimes in very, very painful situations, very unfortunate situations, because it's the only tendon that reaches the uh, P3, sometimes it ruptured. This is a case of, of a ruptured common digital extensor. So you lose basically the ability to extend the digit, if you, if you, if you will. And um, the, the situation here, the, the, the digit should be in this area here. Uh, when the digit in general, uh, as as you recall, it has to be in this area because of the effect of the extensor tendon that comes from here and inserts on. P3. So when the extensor, the common digital extensor tendon works, it takes the hoof into this area right here. However, because it is ruptured, you lose this ability to extend. Remember, the tendon is called common digital extensor. It extends the digit. This is the digit of the horse. When you lose this ability, you lose the ability to extend the digit. Therefore, the digit becomes flexed. 
or over flex even. That's a very, very important uh, 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 case in in uh, in uh, uh, in horses. Um, now, the other two muscles that I told you about are the deep digital flexor and the superficial digital flexor uh, uh, muscles and their tendons. These are very important muscles, very important muscles, and we need to memorize them and we need to memorize their clinical significance. Now, the two muscles, the superficial digital flexor, again, these are flexors. The previous ones were extensors, extensor carpi radialis and common digital extensor. These were extensors. These two muscles are flexors. I told you, two on the dorsal and lateral aspect of the, of the radius and two on the ventral. These are the ventral aspects now. And we have the two muscles that I told you to memorize the superficial digital flexor and the deep digital flexor now superficial and deep so so what are the importances of these two muscles and muscle tendons of course they are flexors so they flex the digit and 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 and, and the fetlock and that's which is which is here and that's that's pretty good that's pretty good uh, function that's physiological. Now, what 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 we encounter, what we encounter clinically, is a little different. We have also to know that we have extra structures coming of the superficial and the deep digital flexor muscles we call these extra structures the accessory ligaments al in this al accessory ligament accessory ligament we call them also check ligaments check ligaments now We have an accessory ligament or a check ligament for the superficial digital flexor, inserts here on the radius, on the ventral aspect of the radius. Again, this accessory ligament is coming of the superficial digital flexor tendon. It's coming of the tendon. It's not separate by itself. It's coming of the, the, the superficial. And there's also an accessory ligament coming of the deep digital flexor tendon and it inserts on the metacarpal bone three so we have two accessory ligaments two accessory ligaments one for the superficial digital flexor tendon and one for the deep digital flexor tendons this is this is we'll we'll talk about why these structures are very important in a second before we talk about that though let's talk about where does the superficial and the deep digital flexor tendons insert and for that let's take a look at this picture Now, the superficial flexor tendon, this is a lateral view, and this is a palmar view. Now, this is the superficial, and the superficial basically inserts on P1 and P2. You can see it more here. On P1, this is P1, and this is P2. Okay? The deep digital flexor, on the other hand, and you can see it better on the Palmer view, is the only tendon 
the only tendon that reaches P3. So now we have two tendons that reach P3 or the third phalanx or the coffin bone. From the dorsal aspect, from the dorsal aspect, you have the common digital extensor, and I showed you when it ruptures what happened to the digit. Because it's extensor, you lose the ability to extend, so it's overflexed. And on the palmar aspect, you will have the deep digital flexor tendon, which basically flexes P3 or the coffin joint. This is the coffin joint right here. And this is P3. This is the coffin bone or P3 or the third phalanx. So, the deep digital flexor is the only tendon that inserts on P3. This happens on the palmar aspect of P3. On the other hand, the tendon of the common digital extensor is the only tendon that inserts on P3 on the dorsal aspect. One inserts on the dorsal aspect. The other inserts on the palmar aspect. One from each side. One from each side. The superficial digital extensor, uh, uh, flexor I mean, inserts on P1 and P2. P1 right here. And you can see some fibers going from P1. And then on P2 here. So this. P1 and P2. This is P1, the long pastern bone, and here is P2, the short pastern uh, uh, bone. Now, this is where the tendons insert. Let's go back to the check ligaments that we've talked about a second ago. This is a dissection showing the check ligament that's coming of the superficial digital flexor and the check ligament that's coming of the deep digital flexor. We call that the proximal check ligament coming from the superficial and the distal check ligament coming from the deep digital flexor. Why these are important? These are very important structures because they are utilized because they are utilized to treat angular limb deformities also that we've talked about earlier that you utilize periosteal stripping on the medial aspect of the radius as I mentioned earlier to fix this case. This, these are the angular limb deformities. Sometimes we cut, we cut the check ligaments to help the bone to grow faster, to catch up with the other side of the, of the bone. That's going very, growing pretty fast. This is one of the procedures, so, to treat angular limb deformities. In addition to that, sometimes you will have over contraction of the superficial or deep digital flexor tendons. And to treat this case, well, this case basically is called club foot contracted tendons, the superficial or the deep digital flexors, and, and to treat this case to relieve the pressure on the on the foot, you do proximal and or proximal and distal check ligament dysmotomy to relieve the uh, pressure.
Lastly, sometimes the uh, this is the hind limb, by the way, but it's the same case in the front limb. Uh, sometimes you have rupture of the superficial digital uh, uh, flexor or the deep digital flexor. So you can see that the digit is, is more extended. It's not flexed because you've lost this ability to, to, uh, to uh, flex the foot. Um, this is basically the, the uh, uh, extent of, of these two muscles. So we talked ex about the extensor carpi radialis and the common digital extensor and then the superficial and the deep digital uh, flexors and of course the, the uh, uh, check ligaments with them as well. Next time I will talk about the uh, carpus and the carpet joint and uh, the components of it and the passive stay apparatus etc.